Quickly before we jump into things, unfortunately this video is going to have to be edited quite different from the rest of my videos. It's been repeatedly blocked worldwide on unfair copyright grounds when the video clearly falls under fair use. So sorry for the inconvenience caused in this video. You know when I accidentally agreed to cover the entire Wrong Turn series by kind of alluding to it in the first video, and then going on to cover the second movie? Well I regret everything. We've now crossed over from the realm of campy yet enjoyable Wrong Turn movies to downright bad Wrong Turn movies. The the premise is pretty simple when it comes to these movies. You take a bunch of young adults and put them in the woods to be horrifically murdered and then eaten by a group of cannibalistic inbred hillbillies. So how do you manage to mess that up? Well, you remove the group of cannibalistic inbred hillbillies and everything else that made the two previous entries actually entertaining. The whole being hunted by a pack of ruthless killers who could strike at any moment thing has been replaced by occasionally being hunted by one lone killer who strikes in the most stupid and inefficient ways, while the characters spend most of their time walking around in the dark, talking about nonsense and being idiots. Yes, they removed the majority of the villains from the movie. You know, the best things about the previous movie? Movies? Well, apart from Wrong Turn 2, Henry Rollins was the best thing about that. The previous weren't exactly the most serious of horror movies, but they had heart and it showed. But this movie, this movie is just straight up bad and its only redeeming quality is that I get to make fun of it. One like equals one regained brain cell. But before we jump into that, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. You boys made it to the big leagues now. Lately, I've been delving into the world of Raid Shadow Legends, mobile's biggest and best RPG. It's given me something to do in between writing scripts and long editing sessions, or even when I've got some time to spare, like when I'm waiting for the kettle to boil or the microwave to ping. If you're looking for a fun and enjoyable mobile RPG experience, use my QR code or links below to download Raid yourself to get on your mobile phone or PC. Let's talk about boss fights for a minute. I'm here to break down Sylvania, guardian of the spirit keep. I kind of feel bad about fighting her. It turns out she got betrayed by the elves of Aravia. Her family used to speak to the spirits on behalf of the queen, but the elves had a sort of cultural renaissance and started getting rid of people they didn't like. So Sylvania came home to her family, just gone. After that, she went off on her own and doesn't want to share the magic of the spirits anymore. Still, we need those sweet sweet spirit potions so you've got to learn how to defeat her. As a boss battle, Sylvania is all about healing. She heals up to half of her health every time she gets a turn, and she also deals bonus damage based on how much HP she has left. However, if you have one or two champions that can keep a healing reduction debuff on her, then you've got her number. The only problem is that she can put up a block on debuffs, so be sure to bring someone who can also remove enemy buffs. What I personally like about the game is building up my own team, leveling up the characters within the team, and then seeing what damage they can cause. There's nothing quite like putting in the time and effort to creating something perfect to your playstyle, and then being able to see it all come to fruition the more you played the game. So what's new in Raid? This month, Raid's got a non-stop schedule of special events and activities, including an absolutely jam-packed Halloween lineup towards the end of the month. We're talking big rewards, tournaments against other players, special fragment events to get some brand new legendary champions, including one very spooky Halloween champion, and much, much more. Raid's bigger, busier, and better than ever, and there are some giant updates coming very, very soon so there's never really been a better time to go and get started. And if you want an even bigger head start, all you've got to do is hit the link in the description or scan the QR code right here. New players will get an epic hero, Chonaru, who is amazing in the Doom Tower. 200k silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill, and the 1 ancient shard, so you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get in game. Look at this cool champion you'll get for free. You'll find your extra rewards here in your inbox for the next 30 days only. Once you're in, you can find me in game under the name BigWillYT, and if you're fast, you can join my clan. And it's that easy, just click the link in the description, and I'll see you in game. The movie begins with us seeing a group of random people river rafting down a secluded stream, and as it's tradition for the wrong turn movies to open up with randoms getting brutally killed, these randoms get brutally killed. The four of them find a place to camp, get their boobs out, and then get killed one by one. The topless woman receives an unwanted nipple piercing as an arrow pierces right through her back and directly into the man's hand, because her boobs are to die for apparently. She takes an arrow through the back of the head, which results in her eyeball sticking 
hanging on to the end of it. And apparently, in Freefinger's culture, human eyeballs are a divine cuisine, as he walks up to her corpse and gobbles up the eye-opening snack. One of the campers accidentally stumbles upon Freefinger digging in and makes a run for it, practically touching every tree that he runs past, because apparently he really likes the way hard wood feels on his hands. But he ends up falling over absolutely nothing and getting a rather conveniently placed spear thrusted right through his mouth. The man with a hole in his hand ends up walking directly into a booby trap. Well, the previous one was a booby trap. And ends up getting sliced into three different terribly janky CGI'd pieces and falls to the ground with absolutely no blood, bones or organs in his body. Like, come on, the previous movie had already shown us the mess that a body leaves behind after it gets sliced down the middle. And that leaves one surviving woman alone in the forest. Because apparently, this already well-established prolific hunter, killer, and eater of people can't track down this one person, terrified and way out of their element. We're then transported to a prison, where I think the movie went and took a wrong turn of its own, because nothing screams cannibalistic inbred mountain men movie quite like prison. At the prison, we see some good old fashioned prison antics, like weightlifting in the yard, horrific racism, and these two dudes who are about to kiss. You know, just one big wholesome time. We then learn that there's going to be a prisoner transfer, and if I know anything, which I do because I've already watched the movie, something tells me that they'll be heading right through the cannibal hillbilly territory, where something will happen causing them to get stranded and horrifically killed one by one. We've got the two prison officers, Nate and Walter, the prisoners, Chavez, Floyd, Crawford and Brandon, as well as an undercover US Marshal Willie pretending to be an inmate due to the suspicions of a possible breakout attempt. And yes, they could have called him literally any other name in the world, but they called him Willie. We see at a police station, not far from where the rafting college kids went missing, where they then get a call about said college kids. The sheriff doesn't exactly appear to be particularly alarmed about people going missing in the area, which is rather strange when you think about it, because wouldn't he be well aware of the murderous inbreeding cannibal family that roams those woods? There's already been two movies where survivors make their way out of the woods after dealing with the mutated cannibals. And on the way to their transfer, the prisoners stop by the police station for presumably a restroom break, where the sheriff does mention something about an incident at an old mill a few years back, clearly a reference to the previous movie, as the mill was just one of the homes that this cannibalistic tribe occupied. So the sheriff does know of their existence, and even if the authorities did go there and find the remains of the dead mutants, who's to say that they were the only ones? We then see one of the mutated mountain men setting up a trap in the woods, or should I say mutated mountain boy? Oi as this is Frito from the previous movie. Remember, the literal newborn demon spawn frog creature? So I'm not exactly sure as to what the timeline is with these movies, because judging by his face, he could be anywhere between 12 and 90. We see that he's not quite as proficient as the previous members of his family, as he almost gets impaled by his own trap, requiring free fingers to come and save him. And I think that's just laziness to be honest. We already know that these wrong turn children can literally be hit by cars at high speed and then get up no problem as if they weren't hit by a hulking chunk of steel at 90 miles per hour. They must have only stopped by the police station for a cup of tea and some biscuits, because apparently they're on their way again. And this time, it doesn't take long for things to start to look bad, because as they're driving, a truck begins to repeatedly slam into the side of the bus, before dropping barbed wire in front of it, causing it to wrap around the front wheel and send the bus tumbling down a hill. This isn't the escape attempt that the prisoners and officers initially thought it to be, as Freefinger exits the vehicle, and instead of just easily killing the entire group as they're all obviously easy pickings, he decides to just walk off and leave them there. I don't know, maybe he's got more important things to do, like dealing with his weakling kid. If he did what would have made sense realistically and just killed them all now, the movie would just end right there at the 24 minute mark, which wouldn't be a bad thing for this movie to be honest. Of course he's just gonna walk away and pick them off later. The writers couldn't possibly come up with anything that actually made a little bit of sense. Now that would require effort. Chavez takes advantage of their new situation and takes Nate's gun away from him, but another officer, who I didn't even know existed, appears pointing a shotgun directly at the back of Chavez's skull. But a knife is launched from the woods and finds itself planted into the neck of this random officer who exists purely just to be killed right now. 
Once again, giving the prisoners access to the guns, just before a barrage of arrows is fired at them, woefully missing each and every target. So what you're telling me is that Freefinger can launch a knife that far and hit this tiny target of a man's neck with ease, but when it comes to a precision weapon like a bow, he can't hit the exact same targets all standing still? Don't get me wrong, the previous two movies were goofy and dumb at times, but the mutants felt like actual predators, a serious force to be reckoned with, and here they feel just, uh, meh. Due to the prisoners overhearing Nate talking to the sheriff before, they know that he grew up in this area, so they force him at gunpoint to lead them through the woods, with him telling them that he'll lead them to a watchtower with a radio so they can call for backup. And as they're making their way through the woods, a woman jumps out of the bushes and begins attacking Nate, because apparently that's what this woman likes to do with her spare time. It turns out the woman is Alex, the only surviving member from the group of college kids. She tells the group what happened to her friends, you know, the whole booby trap and booby trap scenario, and that there's a man that lives out in these woods who hunts, kills, and eats humans because making the weekly trip to the grocery store is just far too much effort. After hearing that the college kids were taking the rafts downstream, the prisoners decide that those are going to be the best option of getting out of here, before almost immediately taking the woman hostage too. This woman can't catch a break. First of all, all of her friends get brutally murdered and eaten by some ugly creature and its ugly kid. She's chased through the woods for what must be a couple of days at this point, and then is taken hostage by a group of violent armed criminals who seem as if they're going to sexually assault and murder her at any given moment. Honestly, they're not really any better than the creature that hunting them. They come across a flipped armoured car way out in the middle of these woods and force Nate to go and take a look. While looking in the front, he comes across a gun that he quickly pockets, before telling the group of prisoners that he's found the keys to open the back up. Once they open the back of the truck up, they discover that it's filled with bags of cash and almost immediately begin fighting over it because people dumb. Nate uses the distraction of them fighting to smartly pass an injured Walt at the gun, claiming that they're less likely to suspect him, but not so smartly checking if the thing is actually loaded, which in turn ends up getting his friend murdered, because after Chavez breaks the fight up in perhaps the most counterintuitive way he possibly could given their current circumstances, you know, trying to lay low and not get murdered and eaten, he fires a gun into the air. Walter pulls out the gun and immediately pulls the trigger on Chavez, but due to it being unloaded, Chavez responds by pulling a gun out of his own and pulling the trigger, and spoiler alert, this one was loaded. And after some more walking and talking in the dark, this movie's got a lot of that, the group accidentally triggers the trap set by the cannibals earlier, but Nate and Alex manage to avoid it, when all of a sudden, Frito pounces and attacks Floyd by biting him, but Chavez manages to shoot him in the chest to get him off. So where's Freefinger in all of this? He leaves his son to get up to his murderous escapades alone and doesn't even supervise him? Now that's just poor parenting. You're supposed to support and encourage your child, come on. With the child injured, Floyd and Chavez hold him down and take a knife to him, but if we know anything about the wrong turn children, it is that they can take quite the beating. Oh. Never mind. They reach the rafts, all carrying bags of money, with the intention of using the rafts to get the money out of here. Chavez shoots Willie in the foot for no other reason than I guess he just felt like it, before the movie conveniently forgets about that and he's fine for the rest of it, while Nate decides to puncture the rafts, meaning that the criminals can't escape with the money, but also meaning now he can't escape. Yeah, nice one, mate. To which Chavez responds by violently beating him. Well, I guess he got off easier than Walter. Meanwhile, Freefinger comes across the decapitated and spiked remains of Frito, where he decides to have a little cry about it. Oh, it's fine for him and his family to take the lives of countless people, including women, children, and babies. But when you do it to him, oh, how dare you? While doing yet more walking and talking through the woods, they come across the keys to their leg restraints that were thought to be lost back in the bus explosion because of course it exploded, but it couldn't be any more obvious that this is clearly some kind of bait for a trap. But that doesn't stop Undercover Officer Willie for finally deciding to make a move and help out for once, resulting in him accidentally walking into the trap and getting his face removed from his body in another rather poorly CGI'd manner. It's as if they watched the laser death scene from the Resident Evil movie and thought, hey, let's do that a lot, but let's do it bad. The problem with Willie being dead, apart from the fact that he's, you know, dead, is that he's still attached to the group's chains, and instead of using their newly acquired keys to remove themselves from this rather easily solvable conundrum, they decide that the best course of action is to cut off both of his legs, 
because of course that's the simple option, which is followed by them immediately coming across a shack and using a tool to remove the chains anyway. Which begs the question, why even use the keys as bait in the first place, if you're going to just immediately forget about them, and then literally 30 seconds later give them a way to get free anyway? That's not the question I should be asking to be honest. The real question I should be asking is why did they even bother to make this movie? Well money and it worked. The budget was $2 million for this movie, and it went on to make almost $7 million, which explains why the franchise didn't just die here with this terrible movie. Because somebody obviously discovered that it was easier to make money creating shitty horror movies than smuggling cocaine. Alright, this is the part of the video where I stop trying to think about things too hard. The surviving members of the group then come across the truck that ran them off the road, and knowing that it belongs to Freefinger, the guy who's been going around and murdering them all for a bit of fun, they decide to send Crawford unarmed to go and steal it, as that's the crime that got him in this situation anyway. Why they didn't just give him a weapon, I dunno, but unsurprisingly, Freefinger springs a trap that wraps Crawford in razor wire, before he then drives off with him hanging from the back of the truck, shredding his face and torso across the paved road as he goes. And in classic wrong turn free fashion, it all looks janky as hell. Floyd then decides that he wants to sexually assault Alex and kill her, because bad guy, but Alex gives him the old 1212, causing him to respond by trying to kill her, because apparently he lives by playground rules, and they state that there's nothing worse than losing to a girl. They got cooties. Chavez takes Floyd's gun due to his poor impulse control, resulting in the pair getting into an altercation. Nate and Alex take the opportunity to make a run for it. All the while, Brandon is just standing there, watching Chavez brutally beat Floyd like... Okay. After not being able to get a hold of Nate, and there being no news about the prison transfer being successful, the sheriff decides that he's going to go out and investigate, and it's not long before he comes across the flipped and burning bus, and after finding nobody inside or around it, he decides that he's going to head off into the woods and try and track them down. We see Freefinger at yet another home belonging to these cannibalistic mountain men. What's that, four homes they've had so far? At this point, they'd be better off entering the real estate market to make ends meet, instead of, you know, chopping the meat off human bodies. He's boiling a poor victim's head in a pot, because nothing quite hits the spot like boiled man brain, and we see Chavez finally having enough of Nate and jumping him before trying to strangle him to death. But Nate manages to persuade him not to by telling him that the watchtower is just over the next hill, but it would appear to all be for nothing, as it seems like it's the same watchtower from the first movie, the one that the cannibals burnt to the ground. Chavez is about to execute Nate, but before he can do so, the sheriff's good boy runs out of the woods and begins to bite down on his arm as the sheriff appears. But just as quick as he appeared, he's killed almost instantly when Freefinger drops a spear from a tree that pushes itself all the way through the sheriff's body and right out of the other end. At least he can sit down wherever and whenever he wants to now. Floyd, all bloody and beaten, comes across the stashed bags of cash and takes them for himself, because apparently this is a really small forest with only one trail. No wonder Freefinger can find them so easily. How about just walking in a different direction? It seems that that would have saved you guys a whole lot of hassle. Chavez discovers that the bags have been stolen, but conveniently for him, but not so convenient for Floyd, Floyd injures his ankle, causes him to scream out in pain, and immediately give up his location. After catching up to him, Chavez is about to kill Floyd, but before he can, Freefinger beats him to it by launching a Molotov, engulfing both Floyd and the money in flames. It's like he thinks he's the Joker or something. Freefinger baits the survivors towards his car by beeping his horn, and for some reason they actually head towards the noise and in the direction of the crazed mutated killer, instead of, you know, not doing that. Because of course all of these movies need to come to their climax with somebody being saved from these hungry mutant men. Chavez gives up Alex to Freefinger, hoping that that would be enough to make him leave them alone. I'm not exactly sure why he thought that logic would work. Freefinger's killed how many people at this point, but yet he still continues to hunt the rest? Poor decision making skills there buddy. And after driving off with his dinner for the night, Brandon sneaks up behind Chavez and knocks him unconscious. Brandon decides that he's gonna head to the nearest town, while giving Nate a gun and telling him to go after Alex. And as Freefinger is attempting to drag Alex into one of his many houses, she grabs a knife, stabs him and makes a run for it. But she doesn't get very far as he tackles her to the ground, where he then proceeds to lick her face. At first that made me think, okay he clearly wants her for more than just food, 
But then I thought, wait, he's a cannibal. Maybe he just likes the way she tastes. She then wakes up with razor wire wrapped around her throat, where she discovers that Freefinger also has taken the female police officer who went out earlier searching for the missing college kid's vehicle. And she was kind enough to stay alive just long enough for Alex to see her before keeling over and dying. That was awfully nice of her. Freefinger begins to cut into Alex's clothes, making it clear that no, he did want her for more than just food, but is interrupted due to the sound of a helicopter flying overhead. As before the sheriff took off into the woods and was put in a permanent sitting position, he called in the bus incident, resulting in a group of officers mobilizing to conduct a search. Brandon is running through the woods, trying to avoid the helicopter spotlight. Because yes, there might be a cannibalistic murderer out here somewhere, but technically he is a prisoner on the road run who's been present for multiple murders. But he doesn't make it far before being knocked out by Chavez, because of course that happens. People seem to be getting knocked out left, right and centre in these woods. Chavez then encounters Freefinger, and after shooting him with his one and only bullet, which of course he brushes off like nothing, he has survived a house explosion and a point blank shotgun blast after all. The pair get into a fight, where Chavez actually seems to be doing pretty well for himself, with him being able to take his axe and actually hit him with it. But as he's about to deal the finishing blow, Freefinger slices down his arm and into his hand, before hanging him from a tree with a hook and cutting into the top of his skull, where he then proceeds to slice out and eat chunks of his brain because he does seem to have a flair for the dramatics. Nate discovers the cabin, as well as discovering the now decapitated sheriff, Frito's head displayed on a spike, along with many different severed body parts scattered all around the room. He finds and frees Alex, before of course being attacked by Freefinger. As Nate is getting thrown around the room, Alex stabs him in the arm, resulting in her also getting thrown around the room. What a fun couples activity, and as he's about to finish off Nate with an axe, the dog once again comes to his rescue, but unfortunately loses his life in the process. Wait till Reddit hears about this. And as he's once again about to finish off Nate with an axe, he's rather rudely interrupted by Alex, who thrusts a spear through his torso, the spear with his dead son's head still attached. Talk about being a close-knit family. They then get in the truck and leave, but as this is Freefinger we're talking about, of course he isn't dead, and he grabs onto the chains, pulling himself onto this poorly green-screened car. After hitting Nate in the arm with an axe, and trying to feel his face like he's a blind person, he's sent flying forwards as the truck collides with a tree. And because this movie thinks that every car crash results in an explosion, the car begins to catch fire. But Brandon appears to conveniently pull Nate from the wreck, and as he's doing so, he's once again attacked, but Nate manages to take one of the hooks and thrust it directly through his brain. And then the car explodes, because explosions are cool. Nate agrees to pretend that Brandon died in all the fighting so that he can escape, while he and Alex sit there waiting for the officers to arrive. And that's when you'd expect this rather, um, interesting movie to come to an end. But just before the credits roll, we see that sometime later, Nate has returned to the armoured car, where apparently they left some of the money behind. But in an M. Night Shyamalan twist, it turns out Brandon is really a bad guy, as he kills Nate by firing an arrow into him so he can take the money for himself before he himself gets killed by another person, and presumably another cannibal, because of course the movie wants to leave itself open for a sequel. And after seeing that, I can't just help think, what was that ending? Way to make a bad movie worse. In any other movie, I'd be absolutely appalled with that cop-out, but being entirely honest, I was just glad to see this movie actually come to an end. How many more of these do I have to cover? Wrong Turn 1 and 2 aren't exactly known for their stellar acting, but they're miles better than anything presented in this movie. The second Wrong Turn was a direct-to-DVD release, but it didn't feel like one. You wanna know why? That movie had heart. Not this movie. It feels like the worst kind of direct-to-DVD release, as if it was made purely to be some kind of dodgy tax write-off. Before we wrap things up, I'd like to give a big thank you to my patrons. Thank you to Dom, Hunters263, Rebecca Pitts, Total Drama Rebooted, A Dandy in Space, Martin Brannan, Natasha Twyman, Rin and Whiskey, Jarrett C. Bees, Nicholas, Pascal Mathis, John, Alex X. Jackson, Fighting the Pirates, Tajvia Sandhu, Chucky Dodd, Amy Denver, Victor Kartalov, Richard McGowan III, Kyle York, Eddie Shivink, Macy J, Reese Harford, and Glorious. Your continuous support to the channel is nothing short of inspiring for me. YouTube can be a little bit iffy when it comes to monetizing these sort of videos, so the fact that there are people out there who are actually willing to financially support what I do is pretty damn amazing. 
So once again, thank you guys. The channel's also got a Discord server, so if you'd like to discuss this movie or other movies in general with like-minded people, you can now come and do that. And if you've also got a recommendation for what you'd like to see me cover in this series, that would be the best place to go about doing so. So once again, thank you so much to my patrons, and thank you to everyone else for watching.